So the gear we're going to use today is a, a bag saying. And so when we talk about fishery sampling, there is a whole host of, of gears that are available to us. Um, bag saying is probably one of the most common. Um, this, this gear is used not only uh, here at Tamuk a lot for a lot of our fish courses, but this is one of the, the big gears that Texas Parks and Wildlife does a lot of their fisheries independent uh, surveying and monitoring um, data for. Um, so the bag saying is it's relatively simple in design in the center. You're going to have a bag, um, it's four foot by four foot by four foot. And then on either side, you have two panels. So if I'm the bag, you then have two panels. And so as you're moving through the water, you're creating this V um, and the, the movement of the water through the, the, the bag, the mesh itself actually creates a current that en entraps the fish. Um, so you can see that it is a mesh. This is a quarter inch mesh um, and it's quarter inch mesh throughout. Um, a lot of your bag sayings used for monitoring populate fisheries populations or, or, you know, like I said, in your ichthyology classes here. Uh, the bag is actually a slightly smaller mesh. So the bag material would actually be eighth inch mesh instead of quarter inch. Um, so with this mesh size, what size fish do you think we're primarily going to be catching today? Smaller fish? Yeah, real small ones, right? So, um, uh, you know, well, we could catch large fish. Most of the large fish are going to be able to outswim you. Um, but so we're, we're basically going to be looking at small fish or juvenile or even larval fish. Um, otherwise, uh, talked about on the video, the, the floats at the top, lead line on the bottom to help keep the net on the bottom, uh, get it dip, dug into the mud a little bit, try to get those benthic fish into the net. And then of course our braille poles. Um, so we'll have two people, one on each pole. When you're moving the net through the water, you always want to keep the braille pole slightly angled forward. Um, so basically you can either pull it along like this, or if you want to do the reverse and pull like that, I mean, it's just kind of a personal preference for you. Um, and then in between the two pole people, we'll have a couple of kickers, uh, stirring up the water, stirring up the, the mud and increasing that turbidity. Um, and also, again, trying to collect any fish that are in the mud or just off bottom and get them into the net as well. Couple of safety things. One, we always want to shuffle our feet. We could encounter stingrays. So we want to go ahead and shuffle our feet, create a lot of vibration. Um, they'll swim away from us. And then when we pull the net up, um, let's go ahead and do what we call clear the net, meaning we open it up and do a quick survey before, before throwing our hands in there. Uh, we have encountered today some sea nettles. Obviously those can sting, so we'll, we'll, I'll safely remove those. And then if we get any large blue crabs, um, their, their claws can do some damage. So we just want to make sure we know they're in there before just going like willy-nilly into the net. So, um, Otherwise, any questions? No? Well, we're, with a small group, we're just going to use one net over here by Arena. And uh, we're going to start over back in the salt marsh area great vegetation and spartina grasses and then we'll work our way back to the wetland centers coming across the the beachfront area and doing pools parallel to shore
side comes to a really sharp point so if you put your finger it's smooth but if you go back towards the head it's very sharp and those scales are actually quite sharp and that's just a fluid dynamics thing it helps them cut through the water um, so this is a scaled sardine but it's closely related to the Gulf Menhaden um, which is a very commercially important fish in the Gulf of Mexico if you go over to Louisiana um, you'll hear them called pokies and these are Commercially fished for fish oil and fish meal. So any of your pet food, any of your makeup products, and other products using fish oil are coming from pogies and pogies. And they use a type of seine to collect, but instead of a bag seine, they use what's called a purse seine, where they actually use boats to, to, to um, deploy these very large seines that they can encircle schools of the menhaden. and dark. Um, that's because they're trying to blend in with their environment, try not to, you know, get preyed upon by larger predators. The cool thing about blue crabs, they're swimming crabs, so the last pair of legs have been modified into these paddles. So out of all the crabs we have here in the Galveston Bay area, um, these are the only crabs that have these um, adaptations. Um, hermit crabs, mud crabs, ghost crabs, stone crabs, they all just have, you know, five pairs of legs. So they can't really get up into the water, whereas blue crabs can. And actually, I was reminded recently that their scientific name, Kalanectes sapetus, means beautiful swimmer, swimmer in Latin. And you can start to see on this juvenile uh, some reddish coloration. So as they mature, both the males and females start developing red and blue on their claws and body. And breeding males are, are really pretty. Actually, tell the, the sex of the crab. We flip the carapace over, and we look at basically what's the telson. So, if you think of lobster, the tail, that's a telson. On the crab, that's actually been modified, and it comes um, in this. This is a male, so it, it looks like the Washington Monument. Um, little power. On a female, it's a wide V, and that's because um, a, a female crab with egg, a sponge crab uses the telson to keep the egg sac close to the body so it's a much wider bean whereas this is a narrow bean so very much wants to pinch you if you want to know how to uh, pick up a crab without being pinched you want to pick up at the base of the swimming paddles either side their claws cannot reach you and that's true no matter what size so as much as he wants to pinch me he can't so that's the safest way to pick up a crab. <laughs> or you can take both claws and pinch them together, but that can be a little dangerous. <laughs> but this guy's not gonna harm you. We you wanna see that one. And then we have a code goby. So the Atlantic silver side, um, we got lots of them, are gonna be a pretty narrow fish, um, kind of yellowish, yellow in color, transparent on the bottom and um, has a lateral silver stripe. They have a very pointed mouth. These guys are like detritivores, um, zooplankton uh, predators. Uh, and then on the bottom, in the bottom right-hand corner here, this is a code goby. So gobies are benthic fishes. They love the mud, they love the stagnant water. 
Um, they're ambush predators, again, feeding on, on very small invertebrates. Um, and so that's these two. I'll pass that around. Then I also saw a sheep's head minnow, which is kind of a pup fish. So we have a, a fotarium full of silver sides. And then this guy right here, that is a sheep's head minnow. And pound for pound, this is one of the hardiest and most tolerant fish on the planet. Um, can survive a wide range of temperature, salinity, pHs. We use these guys in the sea life facility with our mariculture course, where the students actually get to breed um, the fish for their laboratory portion. So really hardy fish, fresh water to full strength salt water. Again, a wide variety of temperatures. Overall, just a really cool, unique fish. Um, they get a little bit bigger, about two inches. And then these silver sides are as big as they get. Red is those nematocysts. And so I'm going to go ahead and throw this back in here. All right, so cool, cool, cool. So we have two different types of anchovies. We have our bay anchovy and a striped anchovy. How, uh, how similar do these look to y'all? Could y'all tell these apart? What do y'all see that's different? Uh, lateral line. Is so with our striped anchovy, we see that that um, the silver stripe, that lateral stripe, is about the, the diameter of the eye. Whereas here on our bay anchovy, it's much smaller. Also look at the snout. You see how that snout overhangs the jaw? Whereas on our striped anchovy, it's basically um, at the edge of the snout. Now anchovies are filter feeders, right? So they're eating phytoplankton. So because of that, they have to get a lot of water through their mouths. And so if we look at their mouths, and I'm going to do it on our, our striped anchovy, I open that up. Look how big their mouth can get. So they're opening their mouth to create a lot of suction and funnel in that uh, water so they can filter feed. Uh, striped anchovies we typically find off the beachfront because they prefer higher salinity water. Bay anchovies we can find in our bays and estuaries for lower salinity. But we're on a tidal pass, and so that's a really cool area to be in because we get fish that um, get just swept in by the current on our high tide. So we can find sometimes more offshore, nearshore fish. We can find juvenile red snapper um, sargasm fish during the summer, um, seahorses occasionally, and so it's really cool to be here on a tidal pass because we get lots of cool fish. So I'm going to throw these guys back. So, uh, um, uh, should be a, a bryozoan, which is a colonial invert. Um, and so I guess this species, um, I thought it usually attaches, but it can get broken off and will start flo floating around. But if you look at it, all of the different little colonial animals just looks like little uh, black dots and it can get like clumpy like sargasm almost um, during certain times of year. Tinophores are comb jelly so while they may look like jellyfish they are actually in their own phylum so phylum tinophora instead of phylum cnidaria which is all of your other jellyfish and tinophores are really cool because while they do have stinging cells they're actually inside the body so we can we can touch them and the, the, the stinging cells are called teens. The other cool thing that they do is that they can actually bioluminesce. And so it's really cool to come out to, to our beachfront during certain times of the years. And sometimes you can see things bioluminescing. And that could either be tinophores or it could be a type of phytoplankton called noctiluca.